<gasps> Hello and welcome to the stream. <clears throat> it is quarantine day 30. How long have we been quarantined? I did get new paper, Maggie. Yes. Um I, my no other ran out of the other notebooks. They got uh, they're all gone. So I'm just using plain old notebook paper now. I got bored and bought an Xbox. Nice, Marin. <laughs> <laughs> what are you currently playing on your Xbox? Star Wars Battlefront. That's a thing, right? Battle. Oh. Fallen Order. Okay. I figured it would be some Star Wars game. Uh, I'm doing fine, Isaac. <clears throat> doing great. Doing great. Um, I did change the notebooks. Yeah, Maggie just commented on that. The other one got full. Um, I am not looking forward to tomorrow, though. I have to go into the school... And they pushed up the construction dates for like demolishing our classrooms. So my classroom is going to get demolished uh, at the end of the month, probably. Yeah, Maggie, I, I check my email all the time. Why? Did you send me an email? No, you didn't. You haven't sent me an email. Yeah, I, I check my email literally every day, multiple times a day. Um, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, the construction will be cool. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy how quickly they're moving stuff up. They figured since the school is closed, they might as well get a start on construction. So. <sighs> Naya was spending too much time on her Xbox apparently got grounded from it uh, I think Bryce everything is on the schedule as far as I know for the building of the new school um Yeah, I don't think it was ever too far off schedule. <laughs> um, potentially, I don't know if they're ahead of schedule. I have to talk to the principal. I'm gonna ask Mr. Sherwood tomorrow. I'm gonna I have a sh like short meeting with him tomorrow when I go in, and I'm gonna see kind of where we're at on things. I think we're at the very least on schedule. So, mm, good old Minecraft. Still haven't ever played. Still haven't ever played. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens with the school. Played shell shocked. The game? What game? Like the tank game? <laughs> I've played very similar games. Um, how many boxes do you have to fill to go all your stuff your classroom? A, a lot. A lot. No, I haven't played that specific version. If you want to go old school, there was original... All of those are based on an original DOS game called um, Scorched Earth Sack, if you want to look into that. They're, they're all spinoffs of Scorched Earth, uh, which was an MS-DOS game. Um, so I am going to be temporarily dislocated into the 400 hall. 
Uh, and so that's kind of where I'll be next year, probably somewhere around where like the ceramics room is right now. Um, okay. Thanks Maggie. That's fine. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, we have to like pack it all up. We're going to pack it all up in boxes. Uh, Isaac, to answer your question, uh, I'm going to get some help with packing up like the glassware and things. Um, but yeah. And then my current, my temporary classroom for next year is going to be down in the 400 hall. So the original plan was that I was originally going to go to go in the new school, but they kind of switched things up and some people pushed for other classrooms. And so we ended up just being down in the 400 hall. So almost all of the science teachers are going to be down in the 400 hall. Um, physics is going to be in the new building, if I remember correctly. Um, but biology and chemistry and everybody's are going to be down uh, basically Isaac but it, it's fine it's not a big deal it's just for one year and it was going to be weird no matter where we were so I'm fine with a, wee, a year of weirdness uh, but the following year we'll have nice new classrooms so for the 2021-2022 school year when the school's done okay um, let's get into unit 4 which is all about reactions. I am not, that's where's the, that's where some of the biology teachers are, Zach. Um, yeah, <laughs> I love the people, those of you that are juniors, um, which is most of you will just, uh, just get to go. And you don't get to enjoy the new school. You'll get some new school next year. Um, like the new... Oh, gosh. Um, I was about to say, 230 hours? Two and a half hours makes a lot more sense. Got to find those diamonds. My diamonds. My diamonds. Okay. <clears throat> um, yo, professor, can chemistry tell me why your P is red? No, but I can block you. Bye. All right. Uh, Roman number four. Uh, unit four, aka reactions. Um, bands are permanent. <laughs> so that guy's gone. Goodbye, 8142. We barely knew thee. All right, letter A. Um... Chemical equations equal changes. All right. Um. <laughs> Hi, David. It's 10 in Utah. Um. Yep. Yep. So a chemical equation is a change. That's that's at its core, right? That's what it, that's why we use chemical reactions. That's why we use chemical equations is to symbolically represent some sort of a change that's happening, okay? So first thing we gotta talk about is we gotta talk about our evidence. Again, this is really simple, really straightforward. Um, what are the evidences for a chemical reaction? What do we got? What are some evidences? Yeah, color change is one. Color change. 
Color change. Oh gosh, we got a bunch coming in. Um, <laughs> temperature change, gas releasing, odor. Those are all heat, light, color, gas. Great. So color change, uh, heat, light, gas, etc. Okay. Oh, I was going to do those as separate ones. Whatever, it's fine. Um, <clears throat> let's see if we miss anything. Oh, uh, change in state. Right, we can form precipitates, etc. Um, change in conductivity. I guess that would be one. Because I guess any time, like any properties that change, are going to be evidences. But Sarah, that one's a little tricky because that could be like for um, some sort of a, a physical change. Kind of what so I want to get into this next idea. Um, Chemical versus physical changes. Um, so, what are some <clears throat> what are some common physical changes? What are some common physical changes? Change in states, the big one. Yeah, big one is change in state. That's the one that, that you're gonna see a lot. So when something just changes in state, right, whether it's boiled, melted, heated, or like, uh, yeah. And then you get kind of the, the middle school, elementary school examples of, you know, bending, crumpling, ripping, breaking, folding. All, all of those are, are technically, they're, they're, I would, those aren't even necessarily changes, right? Um, they are to some extent, but it, it's really going to be changes in state. And then you can also argue that uh, dissolving is a chemical ch or physical change, not a chemical change. So changes in state and dissolving. This one's a little tricky because you can argue this both ways, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, okay, and then chemical change, of course, are all of these ideas. I, I should have done this in a slightly different order, but that's okay. Um, all right. Yeah, so putting in sugar in water, dissolving, that is a physical change, not a chemical change. Uh, why do we still write chemical reactions for changes in state and dissolving them? That's great. Okay, so um, let me try to answer this. Um, B. So an equation doesn't have to be a chemical change. An equation can be for either a chemical or a physical change. Um, my, I filled up the notebook, Lauren. I filled up the notebook. Um, yeah, Isaac, that, it's a little tricky. We're going we're gonna to talk about that. Um, so we can have, let's just say, different kinds of equations. All right, so we can show different equations. So we can actually show change in state. Right? We can say water solid goes to water liquid. Okay. Now this is a physical change, um, but we can still write a reaction that describes that physical change. Now you might, you could argue that maybe this isn't a chemical reaction, but it, it's still an equation that's showing that change in state. So this is a physical change represented by an equation. Um, Sammy, yeah, you can you can think about that, um, but. In my, uh, what you're going to see on the AP test is you're going to see these two things. You're going to see change in state and dissolving as physical changes. Um, you're not really going to see any other examples of physical changes. So changes in state and dissolving. So that'll kind of be our nice, like, standard one. Um, okay. So, and we could also do something like we could show um, a dissolving process as well. We could say we could take something like sodium chloride solid and turn it into sodium chloride aqueous. 
Again, technically not a reaction, but we can still write an equation that describes that process. Um, I guess we'll do another one, dissolving. Um, okay so but then when we talk about when we talk about a chemical equation this is where we're talking about reactions Can't you the physical change is something to be? Oh, you already, I already answered that. Okay, sorry. I thought that was something. Okay, so uh, chemical equations. The biggest thing to, to remember about a chemical equation is that um, it has to be balanced. Uh, why do equations have to be balanced? <laughs> why do equations have to be balanced? Can't have half an atom. Yeah, true. But why else? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. But why is there some law that says we have to balance an equation? Mary's kind of hinting at it. Balancing shows the law of conservation of mass, right? It shows the idea that matter can't be created or destroyed. Um, we have the same number and type of atoms on the left as we do on the right. Um, it's, it's an expression of the law of conservation of mass, which leads into all these other things you guys were saying, which leads into molar ratios and stoichiometry and all those other things. But at its core, an equation has to be balanced to show the law of conservation of mass. Okay, now we have a couple different ways to represent chemical equations. Okay. So we have um, we have balanced molecular. We have total ionic and net ionic. Okay. Uh, if mass can be gained, how come my dinosaur pills grows into a dinosaur? Because <laughs> the density changes, David. The density changes. It's the same mass before and after, just a different density. All right. <clears throat> so what was the deal with total ionic equations? What, what's the difference between a balanced molecular equation and a total ionic equation? guys remember it's been a long time since we've done this total ionic shows ions yeah <laughs> but which ions maggie <clears throat> so remember in a total ionic we're going to split uh strong acids and aqueous ionic All right Ionic and strong acids. Net ionic shows what's actually reacting, and the reason or the way we do that is we remove spectators. All right, remember a spectator ion is something in the total ionic equation that um, doesn't react, right? That stays uh, the same in the beginning of the reaction, at the end of the reaction. It's not directly involved in the equation. Okay, so <clears throat> make sure you guys remember how to do balanced molecular, total ionic, and net ionic equations. Um, okay, make sure, let us see, make sure we can use um, 
particulate representations. Right, basically the idea that you know we can we can represent these reactions with like boxes. All right, let's imagine we have like one, two, four of the or maybe we'll do five. And then we'll do like one, two of those. Um, redox, we're going to get to eventually, Sarah. Redox are a, a type of balanced molecular equation. Or maybe even a, a type of total ionic. But yeah, we're, we're going to talk about redox. Um, example of a... a we're, we'll, we'll, we'll do some examples, Naya. Um, no, you still have to know redox, but you don't have to know electrochem. There's, there's a, a difference. Um, you still have to be able to tell if something's being oxidized or reduced, or you still have to be able to tell um, if it's going to be, um, like, you still have to tell, like, um, looking at electrons transferred, but you don't have to calculate, like, the electrical potential or something that will, yeah. So you have to know the basis basics of redox, just not electrochemistry. All right, so um, down here, right, we could then, we could take this pictorial representation and we could write a reaction. We could say, okay, one of these reacts with two of those to make, you know, these guys, right? Um, you are going to have to balance redox, Isaac, but I'm going to kind of walk you through just a simple way to do that today um, because we unfortunately didn't get to it in class. But we're going to do simple redox balancing, not complicated. Yeah, I know, I know, I remember. It's because of the way your text does it. Uh, hi, hi, Billy June. Uh, potentially, if it's on topic. Yeah, Lauren, you might have to reload the page. Um, okay, that's particular representations. Yeah, sure, Billy June. What you got? Let me see. Um, Sammy, yeah, I still want to have class. Uh, Omega-3. I don't know if they synthesize Omega-3s. Okay, okay, this is off topic, we still have Class Friday. Yes, we're still gonna have Class Friday. Um, our bodies can synthesize them from linoleic acid. Uh, there's some processes we can do it. Um, yeah, sorry, Lauren, you might've gotten hit with a long ad. Um, yeah, DJ, let me go back to it. Technically on the schedule, um, whoop, um, on the schedule, Naya, we originally had parent-teacher conferences on Thursday, and we didn't have class Friday as a comp compensatory day. Um, but because parent-teacher conferences are going to be a little different this year, I'm still planning on having class on Friday, just to keep with the schedule. Give you some normalcy. And yeah, if you ever do miss something in lecture, you can always um, go back and check out the YouTube video. I usually have them up within an hour or so after class. Okay, um, let's dive into the notes. Letter D. Um, let's talk about um, what actually happens with bonds. Um, so bonding, bonds, we'll say bonds. This is kind of just another difference between, um, I know I need to add it, David. I keep forgetting to add it. Um, I'm gonna make a note to add it. All right, I, there's so much stuff I need to do in my Twitch channel that I just haven't done yet. 
I need to like change my banner. I need to do all kinds of stuff. I'm just haven't done it yet. No real excuse at this point. All right. So for chemical reactions, why oh, can't it spell? Reactions involve breaking and forming bonds. Physical changes involve breaking and forming intermolecular forces. Uh, let's see. <laughs> well, emotes were just easy. Um, yeah, so uh, best RE mid. This is um, we because school's closed. Uh, this is kind of how I decided to teach my AP class. Um, I'm teaching. This is how I teach my honors in AP. And so, um, yeah, yeah. Most of them should be here watching, uh, but I figured I'd just do it on Twitch because Twitch is pretty good about stream delay and things, and I can record everything really easily. Um, okay, so sum up, right? Chemical reactions. Sorry, that's ugly. Um, <laughs> um, sometimes I stream League, so maybe uh, some somehow got related. Uh, I'm a, a, the coach for my high school League of Legends team as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Mary, Mary brings up a really good point. Um, so physical changes involve breaking form of intermolecular forces. So the the AP manual specifically mentions this statement. Okay. It says, sometimes physical processes involve the breaking of chemical bonds. For example, plausible arguments could be made for the dissolution of a salt, wa salt in water as either a physical or chemical process because it involves the breaking of ionic bonds and the formation of ion-dipole interactions between ions and solvent, right? So um, you can do like... I, it, the dissolving is one of those like um <laughs> the dissolving is one of those things that like uh can actually be argued as a chemical reaction um the reason why most people say that it's a physical change is because if you just evaporate the solute sorry solvent you get it back okay so <laughs> and no david we have diamonds and plats basically with a gold and a silver, but that's okay. All right. Um, next. Wait. Did I get off? Oh, I did slightly, but that's okay. Whatever. We're just going to keep going. Um... The law of conservation of mass. Just another important detail about the law of conservation of mass. Um, <laughs> so first thing, basically stoichiometry. Right? We've, we've spent so much time doing factor labels that I'm not going to really go into details, but basically every time we do a factor label and we say that, you know, like uh, if A plus 2B makes, you know, A, B, 2, right? We say one mole of this reacts with two moles of that to make one mole of that. And we, you know, use the weights from the periodic table and all those things. Um, it makes it so we're, we're following the law of conservation of mass. Um, and that's all I really wanted to say about that. Because, yeah, we've done so much on that. I don't feel like we need to review that. Uh, Joel, you can tell Clark I said, hey, good old Clark. Is Clark home? I guess he would be home because the semester just ended, huh? 
Uh, what else do we want to say? Oh, another way that we follow the law of conservation of mass is with titrations, right? Titrations are um, a, a experimental representation of the law of conservation of mass. So remember in a titration, there's a couple terms that I want to make sure that we use correctly. We have uh, titrant and analyte. Okay, so the AP book or the AP text uses these terms. So if we're doing a titration, right, some sort of titration. Okay, the titrant is the stuff that you're adding, and the analyte is the stuff that you're analyzing. Okay. So the analyte is the stuff in the bottom, the titrant is the stuff that you um, add to the top. Um, so yeah, so we know that at the equivalence point, so the equivalence point is when um, an equal number of moles is reacted according to a balanced chemical equation. Now, Often, and for like strong acid, strong base titrations, it's a it's a one to one ratio for the equivalence point. Um, but for some reactions, it can be like a one to two ratio, or a two to three ratio, or a, a four to eight ratio. Well, actually, that'd be one to two. A four to seven ratio, whatever it might be, um, is going to be our equivalent. So you have to make sure you know the the mole ratio in determining an equivalence point. Now, experimentally. The equivalence point is determined usually by some sort of a, a color change. And so that color change is called an end point. So the end point is the, um, the observable change that indicates the equivalence point. Now, oftentimes we don't really make a good distinction between equivalence point and endpoint. But when you're doing a titration, say you're adding, um, you know, a base to an acid with phenolphthalein, um, when that color change, that color change, right? When we change from clear to pink, yeah. Sorry, this should be this should be little a, little b, and little c. I don't know why I started doing bullet points. Thanks, Lauren. So we have the titrant and the analyte. We have the equivalence point, and we have the endpoint. Um, so the endpoint is the observable change that indicates the equivalence point. So if we're doing a titration with like an acid and a base with phenolphthalein, when the phenolphthalein changes from clear to pink, um, that's our end point, which if we've chosen the correct indicator would be the equivalence point. So you want to make sure you use an indicator or you use something so that your endpoint and your equivalence point match up with each other. They aren't always the same, but they should be very close to each other. Okay. So this is often an indicator that gives us that observable change. Um, okay, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So that's that. Letter F. Um, three reaction types. Number one, acid base. Oops. Sorry. Okay, three reaction types. Acid base. Okay. So what's our what's our simple definition of acid base? 
if we were just simply give us a simple definition of acid base. What does acid base involve? <laughs> An acid reacting with a base. Duh. <laughs> but how do we, if I just look at a reaction, how do I know that that reaction is an acid base reaction, not some other type of reaction? There we go. Logan's got it. it has to do with protons. So it's a proton exchange. So proton, aka NH plus, exchanges. Right? The acid donates the proton, the base accepts the proton. That's kind of our indication for acid base. We're going to do a little more on acid base in a little bit, but I wanted to do kind of just an overview of these three reactions. Um, the other one is oxidation reduction. Often known as redox, right? So what is what signifies an oxidation reduction reaction or a redox reaction? It's electron exchange, good. So electrons And to remind you um, of our good friend Leo saying "ger," right? <clears throat> Losing electrons is oxidation. Gaining electrons is reduction. Okay, Leo says "ger." Losing electrons, oxidation. Gaining electrons, reduction. Right, and yeah, that goes. And the way we tell that is by looking at oxidation numbers, uh, which we'll get into in a second, Mary. I don't like oil rig, Isaac, <laughs> but you can use oil rig; it works too. Um, the reason why I don't like oil rig is because it, it's when you say oxidation is loss, and then rig is reduction is gain. Oxidation is loss of what? Is it loss of charge? Is it loss of electrons? Is it loss of protons? Is it, right? In Leo says Ger, the electrons are included in the acronym, but it, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> Oxidation is loss of mass. Um, the, 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 the AP manual makes kind of a random side note here about how combustion reactions uh, are redox. And it, just to remind you, combustion reaction is some sort of a hydrocarbon, CxHyOz, plus O2, making CO2 and water. I don't know why the AP manual decides to shove this in right here, uh, but it does. So combustions are redox. I, I know they are redox, but I, I feel like you would want to put this somewhere else. Anyway. Um, so kind of another little thing here, uh, we do want to mention oxidation numbers. Uh, I thought we were going to do it later, but we can do it right here. Oxidation numbers. Uh, remember my rules for oxidation numbers. Um, what were my rules for oxidation numbers? Uh, has to add up to the charge. Um, Fluorine's negative one, and yeah, uh, but those those aren't those aren't good enough, Isaac. Let me let me remind you. So my simple rules are: uh, it must add to the charge. Must add to the charge. Um, break ionic. Must add to the charge. Break ionic, and then most electronegative. P table. Oh, and in between there, H is plus one. Um, this is an easy way to tell if it's redox and doing oxidation numbers. Um, 
Not necessarily, DJ, but you don't have to do the oxidation numbers of everything, right? If you can see that something goes from a, a compound to a specific element, like by itself, um, you can probably just be like, oh, it changes from plus two to zero, therefore it must be redox. You don't have to do everything else. So when you say oxidation numbers, you don't have to do oxidation numbers for everything. You just have to look at individual ones. Um, I'll do, Bryce, I'll do an example um, redox problem towards the end. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll do an example. I'll, let me do an example of this at the end. I'm not going to do it right now. I'm going to do it at the end. We're almost there. Okay. Um, w let me wait till the end and I'll, I'll do another example. Okay. I'll come back to these rules in a little bit. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got to teach simple balancing redox enough that you can get by on the AP test. Um, okay, we kind of need our last thing there. Um, number three, last type of reaction is precipitation. Precipitation reactions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, the AP exam this year, because of COVID-19, is only going to be an online 45-minute, just two short answer questions to uh, two of the long-style free response questions. So, yeah, no, they're changing it, like, drastically because of all the coronavirus stuff. All right, so precipitation reactions. What are our – what's a precipitation reaction? What does it do? So it's usually – a double replacement that forms a solid. I guess you could argue that a single replacement is a precipitation as well. It makes a solid. Now, how did we determine which one of the products is a solid? Yeah, it makes our makes our chunkies. How do you determine which one of the products is a solid? Solubility rules, yeah. Um, but the AP test solubility rules are really, 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 really easy. They only make you know four things. They only make you know um, sodium, potassium, ammonium, and nitrate are soluble. That's all you have to know. You don't have to memorize more than that. You don't have to memorize these ones. I mean, if you have them memorized, it's fine. Um, we learned about these in honors. That's why I have these notes. You really just have to know the idea that sodium, potassium, ammonium, and nitrate salts are soluble. So yeah, according to according to the AP test, lithium chloride is not soluble. Now that doesn't mean what what that means is this is all this is the only kinds of things that they'll be asking you to predict if it's soluble, right? These are the only ones that they're going to have to say, oh okay, um, predict if this is uh, going to be a solid or not. And if it has sodium, potassium, ammonium, or nitrate, it's not going to be the solid. It's not necessarily everything else will be a precipitate, DJ. It's just if they give you a double replacement reaction, if they give you a double replacement reaction and they tell you to predict which of the products will be the precipitate, it won't be the one that has one of these. So one of the products will have one of these ions and the other one won't. And so on the AP test, if it has one of these, it'll be aqueous. If it doesn't have one of these, it's probably going to be the solid. Now, they're going to follow the more complicated solubility rules. And so if you have the more complex solubility rules memorized, you'll be fine. But just know that it, if they're going to ask you to predict a solid product, it's going to be a, and a pretty obvious, pretty easy one. It should be. So, yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's do some just real quick uh, letter G. Um, more about acid base. Let's do more about acid base. Um, Okay, so we first have our uh, 
have our Bronsted and Lowry definitions, right? So Bronsted Lowry definitions. What are our Bronsted Lowry definitions? We kind of already talked about it, but just to recap, uh, an acid is a proton donor and a base is a proton acceptor. Now we learned about uh, the Lewis definition as well as the Arrhenius definition. Um, the Lewis definition is not going to be on the AP test. So you don't have to worry about remembering like the electron pair donating and accepting and those kind of things. Um, <laughs> Bronsted. Yeah, I gotta, lo gotta love uh, Germanic languages and other things. So Bronsted Lowry definition, acid is a proton donor, base is a proton acceptor. Um, okay, water. Yeah, you gotta give them umlauts. All right, so water So water can be either an acid or a base. Right? Water can gain a hydrogen to form hydronium, or it can lose a hydrogen to form hydroxide. Right? So if it accepts a hydrogen and acts as a base, it'll form hydronium. Uh, if it loses a hydrogen, it'll form hydroxide, right? So this is water acting as a base, and this is water acting as an acid. Um, okay, and so then we also remember this terminology of, uh, oops, if I can spell conjugate acid and bases. Right. So for our conjugate acid and bases, right, we take some sort of an acid like, well, I don't know, hydrofluoric acid, right? We can react it with water. We can produce um, fluoride ions and hydronium ions. Oops. Right. And then we can label this reaction as acid, base, conjugate acid, conjugate base, right? So if we look at this, we look, okay, the HF donates the hydrogen, and so that makes HF an acid. The water accepts the hydrogen, that makes water a base, okay? And then if we look in the reaction in the other direction, I guess I should do an equilibrium arrow here, right? If the fluoride gains a hydrogen, it's gonna be our conjugate base. And if our hydronium in the other way, it's going to be our conjugate acid. Okay, so just confirm there'll be none of those zinc. <laughs> yeah, um, probably not. Um, they might like, so it, it, they won't ask you to predict that, Max. They won't ask you to predict the products, but they might write a reaction that says something like, um, you know, like FeOH. Uh, three um, plus water forms, you know, Fe H2O OH2 plus plus OH minus, right? I mean, you can still see that it gains a hydrogen. I, I, I doubt that they'll do some sort of the, like the complex ion formation, uh, but you should still be able to look at this equation and say, oh, uh, this is losing a hydrogen, so this is an acid, and this is gaining a hydrogen, so this is a base, right? So they're, they're going to ask you to label things as acid base, conjugate acid, conjugate base for sure, but they wouldn't ask you to predict the products of an equation like this. Um, they would give it to you and then ask you to write, you know, what's the acid, what's the base, if they're going to do that. Um, but yeah. Okay. Last thing, let's do some redox. So letter H. Uh, balancing redox reactions. Okay. 
So we've talked about how redox reactions are um, an exchanging of hydrogens, uh, or no, electrons, sorry, acid bases, hydrogen. We talked about how redox are exchanging of electrons. And what we can do is we can write reactions down. Okay, So for example, we could write down the reaction um, copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons makes copper solid. Okay. We could also write the reaction um, let's just do something else simple. Let's do um, mm, well, we talked about iron. Let's do iron. Iron 3 plus plus 3 electrons makes iron solid. Okay. So in both cases, what kind of reactions have I drawn? Have I done reduction reactions or oxidation reactions? Yeah, these are called reduction. So these are called these are called reduction half reactions. Okay. Um, probably not, Isaac. I'm just gonna keep it really simple. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna do half reactions. <laughs> because again, if they're gonna ask you a question, I doubt they're gonna be give you one of the more complicated ones. All right, so those are reduction half reactions. We could similar, similarly, uh, we could flip it around to make it an oxidation half reaction, or, or we could write some other reduction or oxidation reactions. Um, let's write, I don't know, let's take something like silver. So if I take silver solid, I could have it produce silver ion and an electron. So this would be an oxidation half reaction. Okay. <laughs> My daughter's knocking on the door. Um, so what I could then do is I could then combine them together. All right. So let's take um, let's take the copper reaction and add it to the silver reaction. Now, when we add these two reactions together, we have to make sure that the electrons cancel. So in this copper equation, two electrons are being gained. And in this silver reaction, one electron is being lost. And so if I go to add these two equations together, I need to make sure I double the second reaction. And so it's gonna be copper two plus, plus two silvers makes copper plus two silver ions. Okay, now you'll notice something here. Um, it seems weird that we need these twos on the silver. The reason why is that in an oxidation reduction reaction, if it's balanced, not only are the number of elements balanced, but the charges are also balanced. We see that this copper is a positive two, and so we have to have two of the silvers to make it a positive two over here. So not in a redox reaction, in addition to just balancing the elements, you have to balance the charges and the electrons transferred. So in this reaction, the copper gains two electrons as it goes from a two plus to a zero oxidation number. And the silver loses two electrons because each silver goes from a zero to a plus one. Okay. Um, let's do, I'm going to do some, another more complicated example, and then we'll kind of be done. So more complicated example. Um, four. Let me look up in the front again. Let's do something like this. It's a little more complex. Uh, no, not that one. Let's look at this one. Okay. So if we have, um, yes, we could. Yeah, so Lauren, 
So in the way that we've written this equation, um, the silver loses two electrons. If we were to reverse the equation and write, you know, these as the reactants, copper and silver making copper ions and silver solid, then that would be, um, in that case, the silver would be reduced. Yeah. So with the way I've written it, uh, if I leave it as a, these as reduction half reactions and that as an oxidation half reaction, um, the silver loses the electrons. But if we flipped it around, the silver would be gaining the electrons. Okay. Um, so let's do, let's do an example. Let's do something a little more complex. So let's show, uh, let's show this half reaction. So let's take hydrogen peroxide plus two H pluses, all right? Plus, I'm gonna, I wanna, I wanna see if we can figure out how many electrons to make water, uh, technically two waters. Okay, so how many electrons do I need to make this equation balance, right? So uh, <laughs> Isaac says we need two. Let's, let's see if we can figure that out. So in hydrogen peroxide, hydrogen is gonna have an oxidation number of plus one. So hydrogen peroxide is one of those weird things where oxygen has an oxidation number of minus one. And the reason why I know oxygen is minus one is because if hydrogen is plus one and there's two of them, right, that makes plus two. And so the oxygen would have to be minus two in order to make them add up to zero, right? They have to add up to zero. So um, oxygen here is minus one. Oxygen over here is a minus two because in water, H2O, if hydrogen's plus one, the oxygen would have to be negative two to balance it out. So if the oxygen goes from negative two, or sorry, negative one to negative two, that means it gains an electron. However, there are two oxygen atoms that are gaining those electrons, and so we need a total of two electrons added. All right, let's compare that to um, something like, let's do this. Let's do NO plus H2O makes, oh, sorry, NO plus 2H2O makes NO3 minus, so these half reactions can be a little complex. 4H plus and three electrons. Okay, so here is our first reaction, here is our second reaction. In this reaction, we're gaining electrons, and so this would be our reduction half reaction. In this reaction, we're losing electrons, and so this would be our oxidation half reaction. And so I wanna combine these two to make a redox reaction. So how am I gonna combine these two to make sure that they work out, right? What we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at the electrons. So, um, yeah, but I don't think you'll see those on the AP test like that, Lauren, or uh, Isaac. I don't think, I think they, they just kind of take a more simple approach. At least I hope. Because normally I do teach it to that level, but we just don't have time. Okay, so two electrons, three electrons. Um, where do those three electrons go, Lauren? They're, they're lost, right? Um, oh, um, I don't, I don't think that they will ask you to do that, Isaac. Um, I think they'll just give you the half equations and ask you to combine them. No, you're good. You're good. Okay, so two electrons here, three electrons here. To, to answer your question, Lauren, where do the three electrons go? They, they don't, right? You don't have, you'll, you'll never have like this half reaction acting in isolation. It'll always be paired with something else, but we can study it from a, a fundamental. I'm, I'm running out of time, so I do wanna finish this. So two here, three here. What do we do before we combine these? We have to multiply these equations. We have to multiply this equation by three, and we have to multiply this equation by two. Why do I have to multiply the equations? Hey. 
Yeah, to get the same number of electrons. And so the electrons cancel. Now, this is what we get if we just write it out, right? If we take three hydrogen peroxides, three times two is six hydrogens. The electrons have gone away, so I'm not going to write them. Two NOs, four H2Os, because I multiplied this one by two. Then we do the, excuse me, the other side of the arrow, where we get six H2Os, two NO3s, and eight H pluses. However, this isn't a good answer because notice we have six H pluses here and eight H pluses there. And we have four waters here and six waters there. So we can simplify the equation down. So our simplified version would be three H2O2, right? These H pluses are going to go away, plus two NO. These waters are going to go away. We're going to get two waters, two NO3 minuses, and two H pluses. Um, yeah. Yep, so we can cancel out. So this should be our final result. So the problem would have asked you, it would have given you this equation, it would have given you that equation, it would say, you know, write the overall redox reaction. And so to do that, you would have to multiply this one by three, you'd have to multiply that one by two to get the electrons to cancel, um, and then you can cancel out anything uh, on the two sides of your equation. So the 4H2Os and the 6H2Os would cancel down to give you 2. 6H pluses and 8H pluses would cancel down to give you 2. This equation should be balanced, um, and it should be balanced not only by elements but also by charges. Okay, I'm over time. Um, thank you for sticking with me. This was our review of Unit 4. Uh, we still have Units 5, 6, and 7. No, you're good, Micah. This is uh, this is fine. We're done. Um, make sure that you do the exam on uh, Learning Suite. I need to or Learning Suite. Make sure you do the exam on Canvas. I need to tell. I need to go through it and look at which ones um, are you don't have to do. I I actually really like it too, Isaac. I'm kind of sad we didn't get to it this year, um, but it is what it is. COVID nineteen. Um, anyway, have a great day, guys. And uh, we will see you on Wednesday for Unit 5. Um, goodbye!